It's 2.30 now and and we've been joined by quite a number of our um, attendees. I would like to welcome you to this month's uh, Young Dementia Network webinar, Research Priorities. I'm Tessa Guttridge, I'm Chair of Young Dementia Network and this webinar is part of a programme of monthly tea time webinars uh, focusing on uh, young onset dementia. The panelists um, can be seen and heard um, throughout the, the webinar and our attendees um, cannot be seen and cannot be heard, but we would very much like you to participate by using the Q&A function and the chat function. And we would welcome, uh, we would welcome all comments coming in. The um, time has come now for me to hand over to Jackie, who's going to be looking after the slides and taking us through the presentation. We've had a little bit of concern around um, the weather and whether it's affecting um, this, this sort of smooth delivery. Um, and we'll try to, uh, to try to make sure that um, we offer this as, um, as smoothly as we possibly can, considering. OK, over to Jackie then. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this um, early afternoon web. I hope you've all got your refreshments to hand, because at the end of the day, it is around cups of tea. I, I, have, I have mine here, so please um, enjoy whatever refreshments you have. What I would like to do first and foremost is introduce myself. I'm Professor Jacqueline Parks from the uh, University of Northampton and I'm lead of the Dementia Research and Innovation Centre there at Northampton. I'm also one of the research members of the Young Dementia Network, um, hence my, my link with the webinar. I'm then going to hand over uh, to Mary to introduce herself. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I hope you're keeping well on this stormy afternoon. So I'm Dr Mary O'Malley and I'm a lecturer in ageing and dementia at the University of West London. One of my research interests is uh, young onset dementia and I was fortunate enough to work on the Angela project with uh, a few of the panellists here um, over the last three years. Uh, Wendy, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, uh... I'm Wendy Mitchell, living with dementia, and I'm also a part of the Young Dementia Network, and on the steering group for that too, and I have a passion for research. And Frank? Um, Frank, Frank? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Arrojo. I'm a former carer and, uh, and also a member of the Alzheimer's Society Research Network. Thank you, everybody. So uh, the question for this afternoon is for you all to think about and uh, please make contributions to the chat box because while I'm chatting, Mary will be keeping an eye on the chat box for us. Um, question for this afternoon is why should I get involved in research as, as a person with living with dementia or a carer? Um, and both, both are always welcome to get involved in research, but the question is, why should you? So we have um, two objectives, really, we'd like to achieve this afternoon. Uh, and I'm just taking signals to make sure you can hear me OK, because we do have some Wi-Fi issues. Um, I want to ask, first and foremost, we're going to try and identify what people with young onset dementia believe should be the top research priority? What's the top thing, the main thing you would like to see research uh, into? And the second um, objective, if you like, is to inform you and your people with dementia and your, your family members and carers how you could get involved if you wanted to get involved in research. So in order to, to introduce those areas, I'm going to leave the first few slides uh, as I say, please feel free to, to, to indicate any questions or suggestions as we go along in, in the Q&A section or the chat box. And I want to ask three things. One is, 
what is research and why do we do it? Uh, and I'm sure many of you know the answer to that one or have ideas about what it's about. I then want to ask the question of who should get involved in research? And I want to sort of conclude my section with why should we get involved in research? Um, so we'll start with what is research? And I don't know, I'm just going to ask Mary, have we got any suggestions in the chat box around what research might be? Any, any, any uh, additions? Okay, so nobody has, uh, nobody's written anything yet, but if, if you would like to share your views to any of the questions, please, uh, please do so using the chat function uh, in, uh, on the Zoom call. So while those suggestions are coming in, I'm perhaps going to give you quite a straightforward answer. Um, so what is research? It's a very methodical, and, and careful, a very detailed study into any, any problem, any scientific problem. And that can be people's experiences. It can be their feelings about care. It can be um, policy decisions. Um, and it can be looking at how many people get particular types of dementia or symptoms or, or, or all of those. But it's a very for very systematic and very in-depth study of, of, a, of an issue that people have identified that they want to look into. Um, and we might start with looking about what we already know on objects, so looking at what information is already out there before we perhaps ask people or interview people or collect uh, information that we call data. Um, about in order to answer those questions. So that's the first thing. And the, the second thing, I'm going to ask any of our four panellists, who do you think should get involved in research? Do you have mm. any suggestions? Mm. Go uh, on, uh, Wendy. Well, I think everybody should be involved in research because everybody lives so if you're alive you should be involved in research i don't know that i need to go to anybody else for a better answer wendy but i'll just see if anybody else has a better answer because that's phenomenal Frank, were you? Uh, yeah. i entirely agree with what wendy said but i think it's also important just to highlight whether you have a good experience good or bad experience or indifferent experience, every experience is relevant. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm just, yeah, brilliant answers. Uh, Mary, do you have any, anything to add? A few of the attendees have been in touch and uh, what well, oh, so I'll just I'll read out a couple of the responses so far. So uh, one person has come back and has said that a, a lady that they provide care for would like research into how to allow people with young onset dementia to be seen and heard as a whole being rather than being seen as somebody who just has dementia. Um, and we've had another response as well. Uh, so why should I get involved in research? Uh, quite simply, it's my duty. I want others on the same road as me in later years to have an easier and longer ride. And we've had a few more responses as well, but thank you so much everyone for, for, for sharing your views. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, all of those, there is no correct answer, but, but I would agree with, um, with Wendy's first uh, feedback that anybody and everybody should get involved if, it, if, it, if they feel it is appropriate for them to do so. And it's not just for researchers, it's for people who have uh, had experience or professionals working in the area or um, children of people with dementia uh, and so on and so forth. So it, it's absolutely everyone, it's not one or, or the other. And I agree with Frank that just because you have an experience, it doesn't need to be positive to share it. Uh, we can learn as much from 
negative experiences, if you like, as we can from positive ones. So, so thank you very much for those answers. The next question is why should we get involved or why should I, if I'm a person with dementia or a carer, get involved? And somebody, I think, in those responses said, it's my duty because I want to, because I feel I should. And lots and lots and lots of different reasons um, why people should get involved. And I just, Mary, if there was any in the chat box about this question before I, before I give some suggestions. Okay. So there haven't been any more responses specifically to this question, but there have been a few suggestions on future research and what future research in oh. young onset dementia could look like. Uh, so, so thank you. Thank you for sharing, for, for sharing your views. And when we've had one come forward and say, I personally would like to see further research into how we can explore and assist the children whose immediate family member has a diagnosis of young onset dementia. Yeah, that we need to continue to consider because uh, mm. family uh, is holistic and we need to, it's a very important area. So in relation to this question, and thank you for those contributions. So why should I get involved in research? I have a few suggestions because it makes it relevant, it makes it mean something, it makes it accessible to everybody and everybody should learn about everybody's experiences. And I think that person who said it's a duty, I mean, you know, there's something about it being ethically right to look into some of these issues. We can only research these things from the experiences of those people who have a diagnosis. Um, we can look at what we might think or we can hear, but actually it makes it far more relevant and far more um, appropriate if we ask the people who have the experience to share with us. So that real world perspective. And having the Angela project, it actually, we find it easier to recruit other people in to studies if people with diagnosis or carers or pharma carers help us to root those people, help us to interview those people because they know they can empathise, they have experiences that they can share. Uh, we also know we can make, not make, we can ask commissioners to sit up and listen if we listen to the voices of people who have the experience. And actually, we're more likely to get funding nowadays if we involve people with a diagnosis or carers in the, um, into the funding applications. And I think that's been a good move and a very relevant move um, because it keeps it real. And the only other thing at this point that I want to share is some of you may have heard, and the document is on the, the right here, Minister Challenge on Dementia. And this was updated last year. Uh, but in this document, it's a policy document, and in this document, a number of people with dementia said they came up with five statements called the WE statements that said uh, what they would like to see, not just in research, but in care and policy as well. And one of those WE statements, the fifth one, talks about people with dementia want a society where they are able to say, we have the right to know about and decide if we want to be involved in research that looks at cause, cure and care uh, for dementia and be supported to take part. So people with dementia and carers themselves are asking that they have an equal voice in shape, research, policy and practice going forward. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Mary, who is going to lead us in a Q session. And hopefully I can bring up the chat box to monitor the chat while Mary is speaking. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jackie, for, for, for that overview of, of what dementia is and uh, for what research is, apologies. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone at home as well that the chat box has been um, receiving lots of, lo lots of messages um, about people highlighting about what research uh, 
should be conducted on young onset dementia. And I think uh, following on from your point, uh, Jackie, about the WE statement, it's, it is important to highlight that people with dementia, what, well, all of us want to know about opportunities to be involved with research and to find out about the different ways in which we can participate. And I'm sure Wendy and Frank shortly will be able to uh, reflect on their own experiences and involvement in research projects and opportunities that, uh, that they've been involved with. So I'm aware that we have quite a varied audience uh, watching today. So we may have some professionals who work with people living with young onset dementia. We may have some family supporters, people living with a young onset dementia. And really that the question we'd like to put out to everyone at home and also to Wendy and Frank um, is, so what, what research should we do that would be of interest to you? And in terms of research, what, what is important to you in terms of young onset dementia? So I'd like you to just, the people at home to have a few minutes to think about uh, what's important to you and what we should research. But I'll firstly uh, move to Wendy um, and see what, Wendy, what, what are your thoughts on these, on these questions? Oh my goodness, Ruth. there will be so much. Oh no, put the, put the questions back up again because I forget them. <laughs> I, 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 I popped um, them back, back up, Wendy. Thank you. Um, so what research would should we do that would be of interest to me? Uh, I think simply around living, you know, to, to give to give that whole diagnosis process, um, get it turned on its head, to focus, to give it a balance of the clinical expertise from the um, clinician, but also to persuade them because they like evidence and research provides the evidence that we also want to know how to live. And that, that combination at diagnosis and beyond, because that's what's important, beyond would be great research topic for me. Um, you know, what's research, what research is most important for young people with dementia is age-related research, um, not the blanket cover of, um, that would involve all stages of research. So it's, a, it's, it's all around age-related research for me. I don't know if I've explained that very well. Yeah, thank you very much, Wendy. Thank you. And and Frank, what, what, what are your thoughts on these questions? Um, well, actually, I can relate my view to a research project I was involved with, which is when I first met you and Jackie, which was the Angela <laughs> Project, which is, I think, is an appropriate way to answer this. It's basically what that project, well, what I'm passionate about and what I think there's a lot of room for improvement is about getting people diagnosed early so that they can uh, it's sort of related to what Wendy said um, which is basically um, too many people still go undiagnosed these days I think it's a bit of a scandal actually and what we need is a uh, the, the diagnosis system as well as the support that comes with it to improve so that everybody as, as much, you know, uh, everybody can get diagnosed as early as possible so that they can get the support they need. Um, and that's, and that also relates to my own personal story as well, where my late mum wasn't actually formally diagnosed until weeks before she passed away. So, um, for me, it's that diagnostic process because until you can diagnose people, you really have no idea how many people there are living with dementia. And at the moment, the diagnosis rates are still too low. 
but it's that related support which Wendy also referred to as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Frank. And I think well, what, what you've highlighted has also been echoed in some of the responses that we've had from uh, the, the audience uh, at home. So but people have, have said that early accurate diagnosis um, is, is, is important to them in terms of research. Um, someone else has, has highlighted early diagnosis and um, that there are still a, a number of delays in receiving the confirmed diagnosis. As some, someone has come and said that they would like more information about how to get involved in research and the different research opportunities and that they've not had enough information yet. So hopefully at the end of uh, this webinar today, mm -hmm. we'll be able to highlight a few different ways that you can find out information about research opportunities. Someone has said to see the person, not the dementia and that they agree yeah. that we need more information on how to get involved and that they would like to be uh, involved in more research studies. So that, thank you very much. There have been a number of responses that have come through and hopefully we'll be able to read some of these later on. Um, but moving on that, to, oh, sorry, Jackie. That, Sorry, I was just going to say that's really lovely, Mary, if you can keep an eye on that chat box, because at the moment they're not coming up on my screen, so I, I can't keep an eye. But if you keep an eye, if you're able to, that would be lovely. Yes, no, absolutely. Thank okay. you. Brilliant. Okay, so... Um... Yeah, that, thank you everyone for, for, for answering these initial questions. And for this next part, we thought it would be, it would be lovely for, for Wendy and Frank to, to share their experiences of how they've been involved in research and give some of their examples. So to begin with, um, you've been introduced to Wendy Mitchell before and I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with Wendy. I've been following Wendy's blog uh, for a number of years. Back when I was a PhD student, uh, I, was, I was reading all of Wendy's blog uh, entries. And I, I found it very, very eye-opening as, as, as a student. And um, I was delighted to hear about the number of different research projects that you've been involved with. And it's been great to work with you um, on some research projects too. So um, I thought I'd hand over to you, Wendy, to, to introduce yourself. And we also have a few questions for you on the next slide as well. Okay. So I'm Wendy Mitchell. I'm, oh gosh, how old am I? I'm 64 years old, I think. And I was diagnosed with mixed dementia at the age of 58 years young. But when I was diagnosed, I desperately wanted to take part in research. But my clinicians decided for me that I shouldn't be offered the chance, the choice. That I had enough on my plate being diagnosed with dementia. But it's actually for me to say yes or no to researchers, not someone else. To me, research means simply finding better methods, methods that benefit, new, new ways to, to care, new ways to live. To me, sociological and technological research is just as important as clinical trials. And for those living with dementia now, they're even more important as we have to find the best ways to live. We have to find the best ways to support people and the best ways to care, to care for those who can no longer care for themselves. And I've been involved in so many studies now that I can no longer list them all. But the ones that I remember best are the ones where people listened and acted on what I said. And the art of listening is very underestimated. And not every researcher is as skilled as this, at this as is necessary. Uh, those who hear also what isn't being spoken 
and probe to find out more are often the best researchers. And that's why I decided to venture into their world and see research from their side of the boundary and what a different world it is. But a, mm. a participant like me venturing into their territory brings a whole new perspective. Their professional expertise combined with my expert by experience knowledge is a win-win situation and what makes for far better research. It can be something as simple as looking at a leaflet and saying it, if it looks right, are the colors right? Does it make you want to take part? Then in a deeper advising on question content or looking at outcomes and everything in between. Everyone has something to offer. So never underestimate yourself if asked for your opinion because it could make for better research. And that's why research mustn't be one-sided. It mustn't just be research telling us their outcome and changing practice. It's so important for researchers of all specialties to engage with the very people they aim to benefit. And that's why research has become a passion of mine. I sit on advisory panels of every kind and I'm a co-researcher. I'm doing my own interviews tomorrow. A, a, a present, uh, they're, they're look, we're looking into why some people find it hard to accept home care in order to inform home carers to, to react to reluctance instead of dismissing it as someone just being awkward. So being involved in research doesn't have to be just a participant. There's so many can be involved. So finally, why would I encourage people to take part in research? Well, imagine yourself being given a diagnosis of young onset dementia. Your life falls apart, you feel worthless and of no use to anyone anymore. Services are often non-existent, especially in my area. So you feel abandoned. That's what happened to me in 2014 when I was diagnosed with young onset dementia. But now imagine if someone came along and asked for your opinion, asked you to be involved in gathering information Someone who was genuinely interested in what you had to say. Imagine how that would make you feel. Imagine the impact on your well-being. Finally hearing someone acknowledge that you still had something to give. That you still had a valuable opinion and views that mattered. And that's what happened to me when I started to be involved in research as a participant. As soon as I, as, as I said, as soon as I was diagnosed, I wanted to take part in research. They, but my clinicians never offered me the possibility or the chance. We need to have an alternative to just hoping and wishing we don't get dementia. But this can only be achieved through research. And being involved makes you feel valued and as though you're contributing to possible future developments and changes. You could be helping your children or even simply future generations. However, I know researchers can find it very difficult to find people who will take part in research. And this may be due to overprotective clinicians or overprotective family and friends, but may also simply be due to the lack of understanding around the meaning of research and what it entails. And research simply means trying to find reasons or better ways. Without research, we can't change 
the future. We can't change current practices that might not work. And for those of us living with dementia now, we need hope and research gives us that hope. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I, I want to say that's inspiring. Um, I absolutely love listening to you and you speak with such commitment and passion and you say it far better than, and, than certainly I could uh, say it. So thank you uh, for sharing that experience with us. I just wondered, Mary, if we had any immediate observations in the chat box. I've had a couple come in in response to uh, Wendy's presentation before I introduce Frank. Yeah, thank you very much, Wendy. And uh, a few people who are watching at home have uh, said uh, how, how wonderful your, your talk was. Uh, well said, uh, beautifully put, Wendy. Um, that was deeply moving as well. Someone said. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much for, for, for sharing that. Uh, and I think Wendy is a testimony, as Frank said, we, we all know Wendy through the extensive work she does and, and the impact she makes. So, you know, Wendy is testimony to how you can get involved and actually make a, an absolutely meaningful contribution. So thank you very much, Wendy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm it's my pleasure to introduce Frank. I'm just going to move the slide on. Uh, and as Frank said, I met, uh, I met him uh, as part of the Angela Project team. And Frank was, um, I want to say, uh, offered to come on to the uh, Angela project in his capacity as an Alzheimer's Society monitor, uh, a network volunteer, but he came on the Angela project as a monitor. And his contribution was um, uh, very uh, influential on the um, public and patient involvement forum that we had for the project, which I'm sure he'll tell you more about. And, and, I, and I had a again, the, the joy to uh, participate quite fully in as well. So I'm going to hand over to Frank and let him um, explain his role and his, his, his involvement in that project. So thank you, Frank. Okay, thank you, Jackie. And, and uh, follow that after Wendy's speech. Um, hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, as you can see, um, I'm a member of a few organizations and those this is before was just some of them, not all of them. Um, but moving on, um, I thought I'd just start by saying, why did I get involved? Um, so if we can move on to the next slide. So here's a photo of uh, my late mum, who um, lived with vascular dementia for some 20 years. When that photo was taken, little did I know how my life would change. She'd already been, when that photo was taken, uh, she'd already been living with dementia for 13 years, but it was undiagnosed. And uh, I was her carer. Um, but the reason, but that photo doesn't explain why I got involved. The reason I got involved is basically because, because as I already mentioned before, mum didn't get a diagnosis until very late on. We struggled for years, both of us, with little or no support. And the reason I got involved in research was to try and turn those, you could say, poor experiences into a positive. Because I thought, um, you know, how, how, else, um, how else could I move on with my life? How else could I make a contribution to society or to persuade others to change, uh, to change the way they, they, they looked at mum and, and myself? But it wasn't just my story. Um, there are others I got to know, which you can see on the next slide. Um, because when towards the uh, towards the uh, the end, uh, the last few months of my mum's life, I did get some support and met a group of other family carers. And here's such a photo. And what became apparent when I met other people who were strangers to me was that many of the issues not just my mum, but I was living with, they were living with as well. So it was like you could say a sort of confirmation that I wasn't on my own. I realised I wasn't on my own. And so I thought I'd, um, so I'd been involved in research for the past 10 years. So I thought I'd talk about what does research mean to me? 
which we can move on to the next slide. So because I've been involved, like Wendy, for quite a few years, I came up with uh, <laughs> an analogy which um, feels right for me um, because I, I say it's like stepping onto a large bus going on a very long journey because nothing happens overnight. And with the final destination being having a positive impact on everybody, and I don't mean everybody's knowledge and education. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've listed four bullet points there, okay? So, I talk, so as you can see, I'm not just talking about biomedical research. I'm talking about all research, care and health research. So I'm talking about transforming attitudes and behaviours. The reason I mention that, just to give you an example, if it wasn't for our GP's attitude or behaviour, mum would have got diagnosed much earlier. I talk about customs and practices. Well, the times my mum was an, an inpatient in hospital because she had a UTI, and it became apparent to me that I actually knew more about what I was happening to mum than the, than the doctors and nurses. I also talk about transforming procedures and systems. Well, an example of that would be about the diagnostic systems, which is where we are touching on the biomedical. Because I know now, didn't know then, how difficult it is to diagnose somebody with early onset dementia. And finally, the final bullet point, I, I talk about cultures of the team and the environment. And an example of that would be about the way I had to battle with my local social services department. And it took over a year for them to, for, for them to come and actually properly give my mum a, 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 a care assessment. So that's just some examples of why I've got involved. And as you can see, it's not just biomedical, it's, 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 it's a long journey. So how have I been involved in research? So as you can see, there's a few bullet points there. And Wendy's already touched on it. The first one, well, I did actually participate in research projects. The very first one I participated in was actually as a result of me being, being very angry when I was still caring for mum. Um, because we weren't getting the support we needed from our local continent service. And so I'd noticed a project on continents, so that's why I, I, I joined. That was the very first project I participated in. But also moving on, I, um, I, as, a, as a member of the Alzheimer's Society Research Network, I'm involved in commenting on applications for, for dementia research projects to try and assess um, how value I think, how valuable I, I think they, they could be, and and make and make comments to try and improve application. I'm uh, currently a member of the Alzheimer Society's uh, Care and Health Research Grant Panel, which has is a is a, a research program um, uh, whereby um, we get the Alzheimer Society get plenty of applications in on each funding round, and they have to make decisions on which one should go be prioritised the funding. So, so uh, as, as a member of that grant panel, uh, the outside society is able to involve people with real experience. It's not just carers, it's also people with dementia on these panels. As Jackie mentioned when she introduced me, I'm involved in monitoring research projects. And as she mentioned on the Angela project, I, I was gladly helping to help the team to try and help with the design and drafting of information sheets and all sorts of materials they would they would use in, in their communications with people with dementia and carers. Um, I'm also, because I've been involved in doing this for so long, <laughs> I'm also now developing, you could say, relationships with researchers and sometimes they come to me in, you could say, in the development process, whereby they're thinking about um, submitting an application and they contact me to, to seek my opinion how valuable this is and any expertise I can provide. And finally, I'm involved in the implementation and dissemination of research outputs. But I think in all of these, I think it's important to highlight it's, just, it's not just my experience 
as a carer of caring for mum. And it's not just my experience of knowing other carers, because I, I run a couple of other carer support groups. I, use, I also use my experience in my professional working life in, towards this. So, um, so all those skills and experience I've developed over the years, I've been able to use to benefit in, 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 these, in each of these specific areas. And so moving on, why would I encourage other family carers to get involved? Well, I, I think, you know, with the two, the two carer support groups I, I actually run here where I live, I'm always telling them your story, your experiences are just as relevant as mine. And also, the more personal stories that researchers hear, the better information and the better opportunity they have in which to get down to the nitty gritty and actually produce what I've called evidence-based outputs. Now, Jackie referred to the dementia we statements. There is another dementia we statement, which is talking about delivering evidence-based care. So, um, so, so there's another we statement that's just as relevant on research as well. But also, as Wendy already said, hope for the future. You know, if we don't have any hope, well, where, where can we go? We want to improve. I don't want anybody else to go through what I went through in caring for my late mum, all those bad experiences. I want them to, to go through the good experiences I had, but I don't want anybody to go through the bad experiences I had, which is just as important. And finally, as I already touched on, because it's helped me, it may help you personally to find something you feel passionate about. And also to include using all the skills you have, not just the caring skills that you've developed, for the benefit of society at large. And I'm going to just give you one example where I think my involvement in research has had an impact. Here is um, a poster I, I had the privilege to actually put together, which involved a small working group of people with dementia and family carers, which is a poster I hope you will see. Well, I hope you don't see, because otherwise you'd be an inpatient in an acute hospital ward in England. <laughs> But if you are, this is a poster that was drawn up um, uh, as I'm uh, in one of my other responsibilities, which talks about what to expect if you are having a stay in hospital from the doctors and nurses. And there's no way I could have been able to coordinate this poster if it wasn't for all those other experiences I've had today. And that's me. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Frank. Again, um, another inspiring talk and um, a great deal of examples there in terms of how you've got involved and how your expertise has informed, you know, research and, as you say, evidence-based care and, and how much you've got out of it, but almost as well how much you put into it. Um, so really appreciate that contribution and I'm hoping that it's inspiring people at home to sit and think about you know how they might want to get involved and and also we've talked quite a bit about what might be the areas because sometimes you have to prioritize what you focus on and and, and and get on that big bus bus and go on a long journey frank so you know uh so at this point i'm going to hand over to mary who's going to lead us in a little bit of discussion um around what might be some of those priority areas I'm hoping we've got a few in the chat box, Mary. Yes, no, absolutely. And then thank you very much again, Frank. We've had quite a few comments come through uh, from audience members uh, that, that thanking you for sharing your experience. And what, what I really liked about, about your presentation is how you, you've highlighted the various different ways that you've contributed to research from participation to sitting on research application boards, to really co-researching projects from the very beginning when these initial ideas are coming together and it's it's fantastic to see that that's going on and that you've been involved in those discussions um and yes there have been quite a few uh comments coming through where, where people have talked 
and shared uh, that, that they've had similar experiences uh, at the point of uh, being at the GP. And uh, unfortunately, uh, primary care doctors not recognising uh, that the initial symptoms of dementia in younger people. Um, so I just, um, on this next slide now, um, yes, I'd, I'd like to thank both Frank and Wendy. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing your uh, your experiences of being involved in research and I, I can I can see and hear that you've you have both really contributed to to research priorities surrounding dementia and this is a question that is for uh, the viewers at home but also for Frank and Wendy and I know it's quite difficult to narrow narrow, narrow everything down into three points but we'd be quite keen to know what your top three priority topics for young onset dementia research would be. So if the viewers at home could uh, spend a few minutes now to think about what their top three could be. And I'll firstly move to Wendy, if that's okay. Sorry to put you on the spot, but what would be your top three? Um, I I think it was Frank that touched on it before, is the diagnosis process. A more mm. robust, timely, mm. accurate diagnosis. Um, mm. The, um, I suppose it's the how, you know, research into how, you know, be it through um, imaging or anything that would would help bring about a, 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 um, an accurate and timely diagnosis. You know, no one should have to wait 13 years to be diagnosed. No one should have to wait three years. You know, it's, it's, it's bringing that process into being more accurate, but also, um, Another priority for me is the distinguishing between all the different types of dementia. I think we have, I think we're in danger of being lumped into certain types of dementia at the moment at diagnosis. And I don't think enough is known about the, the brain and enough is known about how we we all fit into the the different types of dementia because they're all very different and i i think we all many of us have a huge mix of them but there's no research to prove all that i, I can't think of anything else offhand <laughs> there are two very meaty mm. ones wendy so we'll, <laughs> we'll chalk those one up yeah. yes Thank you for that. I, I, I'll hand over to Frank to see what his top three might be. Well, I, I don't want to repeat <laughs> what Wendy just said, but um, I think we are we are going to going to agree on this. But um, as we've already touched on, I think it's about it, well, the number one priority for me is about improving the diagnostic procedures available to clinical staff. No, oh, that's the word. Mm. I think that's what Wendy was trying to yes. get with that, and yes. I, I agree. Um, um, because I know I know it's a struggle for them not just to diagnose, but also what type as well. Yeah. Um, but I only learned this when I got involved in research. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. It's, it's amazing how much I know about now, which I wish I knew when I was getting from my mum. So that's, you know, it's, um, but yeah, it's the diagnostic processes, but then related to that is also there is a big, I think, still, I know there are a lot of progress being made, but there's still a big need for education and training mm. of even clinical staff as much as everybody else. Yeah. Mm. On how do you, how do you communicate with people who may, who may have cognitive problems? Mm. Um, but may have permission, may not. It's that communication side. 
And then, of course, related to all those two, it's the support as well. How do we support people with dementia and the families and the friends? Because um, I'm fully aware of many other people I know who've got diagnosed, and that's it. And they're, mm -hmm. they're expected to go on and, and live their life, but they've not had any training in, in how to live their life, both as a person living with dementia and as a family or friend supporting somebody living with dementia. So those are the three areas I, I would highlight, which, which are, I know I'm speaking in, in general terms, but those I think I call mm -hmm. the big three. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a brilliant contribution. I've... Um, I've, I've got a couple here, Wendy, in the chat box. Um, mm. Sorry, Mary. Shall I shall I share the, a couple of responses in the chat box? Um, we've got we've got one contribution here where um, somebody absolutely concurs with you, Wendy and Frank. Early diagnosis, delay in treatment of symptoms, and setting out a minimal legal minimum legal standard of care at various stages on the journey. Um, We've got one about GPs not being expected to be to be experts in, in all medical conditions. They should, however, be experts in knowing where their patients should be referred to to get the right help. So something around GP referral as well. We, we, you know, that would help with timely diagnosis, wouldn't it? Uh, and again, some support on uh, diagnosis and also something around subtypes is, is essential. So the two two areas you've been touching on, as well as as well as referral, I think, are, are quite strong there. Hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And uh, that there's one point here about how some doctors have not heard uh, of certain types of dementia, such as frontotemporal dementia. So that links to, to your point about, about, ed about education and, and raising mm. awareness uh, with, with clinicians. So thank you, everyone, very much for, for sharing your views. Um, and Hopefully throughout this session, uh, you've been able to hear of a few different opportunities of how you can get involved in research and the different ways in which you can participate, can be involved in co-research and also potentially review research applications as well. If you aren't already uh, a, a member, the Young Dementia Network uh, regularly send out newsletters which highlight research opportunities surrounding young onset dementia that they're aware of. So please do sign up uh, if, if you aren't already a member. And if you live local to a university uh, and, it, and if there's a dementia institute, they often have recruitment uh, databases or a, a public and patient involvement lead who you can reach out to and they may be able to signpost you to different research opportunities. There are also platforms like Joint Dementia Network uh, which you can uh, look at research. and yes yes <laughs> Dementia Researcher as well. Um, so there are a variety of different platforms and I understand this is difficult when they're all uh, based in, in different parts of the UK, um, but hopefully some of you will now be able to find out a bit more about research. And if any of you at home are free next Thursday, we have an event on, it's called Engaging People Living with Young Onset Dementia in Research. It's a Welcome Trust project that will be running now uh, for another, how long now, Jackie? Another 18 months. 18 months. 18 months, 18 yes, months. it's been going for a little while now. But this project is all about uh, public involvement and engagement with younger people living with dementia. And next week we have an event on, it starts at one o'clock and finishes at four o'clock. We have a number of breaks throughout the day, but we have speakers who will be sharing their experiences of being involved in research. So people living with young onset dementia, as well as researchers uh, who have uh, been involved in various projects that have involved younger people living with dementia. So uh, if you'd like to sign up for that, I believe the information will be in the follow-up email that you will all receive at the end of this. But I would like to thank you all very much again. Thank you to uh, Frank and Wendy for 
for sharing your experiences and, and being panellists today. And also a big thank you to everyone at home who has been actively involved in the, in the group chat. And brilliant. Thank and, you all uh, very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Wendy. I would also like to thank Mary, who's helped, helped us to put this on today and organise it. And our thanks go to uh, Tessa and Kate at Young Dimension Network for hosting this. So thank you very much. Lots and lots of thank yous. Big thank you for me, um, from me as well to our lovely panellists. And um, the chat has been um, so stimulating, actually, the, uh, both the input from the panellists. I never fail to learn something new at these webinars. And we will definitely be capturing the chat and passing it through to uh, Mary and, and uh, Jackie so that they can um, they can have a really good read through and pick up the suggestions because I think we've just touched on the surface of what was what was on the chat. Um, so huge thank you to everybody. Um, the uh, slides and the all the, the um, signposting links will come out to you in the next 24 hours as will the recording links to the recording and okay so there's there's a there's a comment from um, uh, Peter around um, some of the comments uh, chat comments being visible um, only to panelists so let's have a think about what we can do to share those um, the, the chat with all attendees. Um, uh, we'll have a think about how we can do that afterwards, Peter. But thank you for that, um, that thought. We want to make it as useful as possible um, always. Our next uh, Tea Time webinar is on the 17th of February and it's a warm, well, a heartwarming and welcoming one, I think. It's around generosity and it's by the Deep Group um, stand. And I've absolutely forgotten what stand uh, stands for, but I know I uh, will find out in February. Um, anyway, look out for the invite link to that. So that'll be coming out in the Young Dimension News. Um, in the meantime, uh, thank you very much for attending and um, uh, another great webinar. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye.